Hello, everyone, and welcome to the eighth iteration of this massive open online course for the University of Nicosia and our master's degree in digital currencies. This is Andreas Antonopoulos. Uh, welcome back, a uh, whole new cohort, uh, probably the largest ever participation we've had. I hope you all stick around for the entire course and um, we'll have some fun learning all about Bitcoin, blockchain, cryptocurrencies and digital assets. If you um, have questions, please drop them in the chat box um, so that I can answer them live. Otherwise, we'll also be answering the questions that were promoted through the forums over the past week. Now, please, let's keep it focused and on topic. If you're wondering why I'm not answering your uh, question from the live chat, I apologize. The most likely reason is that you're asking about something that's going to be in one of the next six sessions. So I'm not going to be talking about transactions and mining and SegWit and forks and why China closed their exchanges or did they, who knows, and um, all of that. That's going to come a lot later. Today we're focused on Byzantine fault tolerance and the basics of uh, the consensus algorithms. So please keep your questions focused on these topics and uh, so we can have material for the next sessions. If we answer everything now, there won't be anything left to discuss. All right. First question comes from Eric. And Eric is asking about the Byzantine general's dilemma with physical coins and paper wallets. Suppose three persons have no access to the internet when they speak, well, sorry, when they seek to exchange value in cryptocurrency. They have only their paper wallets and physical crypto coins. How do they overcome the Byzantine general's dilemma? Afterwards, they get on the internet and could up Date the blockchain with the exchange that took place offline, but how does that work and how does that affect the Byzantine general's dilemma? Um, Eric, if you do not have access to the blockchain, um, then you cannot, in fact, resolve the, the Byzantine general's dilemma, specifically the subset of Byzantine fault tolerance, which is the double spend problem. So I'm holding um, crypto coins in a physical device, um, let's say a paper wallet or um, a some kind of um, other device like a stick. Um, Open time would be a good example, a crypto token which contains a private key in it. Um, and I have that, and I'm trying to do a transaction with someone. How does the other person know uh, that the coins that are on that stick are still available, that they haven't been spent? Now, this is a difficult problem to solve, because even if I have a full copy of the blockchain, let's say I synced it all to my laptop before I went on a trip, and I have the information you know, up to last week, um, so I can actually take the Bitcoin address or some other public identifier from a, a paper wallet or a crypto stick, and I can verify that at some point in the past there was uh, Bitcoin on there. But I don't know if that Bitcoin has been spent. A whole week has passed. I am out of date. I no longer have an up-to-date copy of the blockchain, and I don't have any idea of the current mempool. Um, so I have no copy of the mempool, no copy of the blockchain. I can't solve the Byzantine General's dilemma. I could take a risk, but um, uh, at, at that point, I can't use those technologies to assure myself. There are some interesting options there. If somebody presented me with um, an up-to-date copy of the blockchain with proof-of-work in it, I could then validate up to the, the last block issued and have a much, much higher degree of certainty that the coins have not been spent. Again, not 100% because I don't know if there is a transaction currently being propagated, about to go into the next block that spends these coins from right underneath my feet, but I do know a bit more if I have a latest copy. One of the interesting solutions to this problem is the understanding that participating in the Bitcoin blockchain is a highly asymmetric function. You need to download gigabytes 
uh, of data um, in order to receive the blockchain and receive the stream of real-time transactions, but you only need to update 350 bytes. You only need to upload 350 bytes or so to make a transaction. And one of the best ways of doing that is with a satellite feed, uh, because you can scale that very nicely. People, you can have an infinite number of receiving stations receiving from a single broadcast satellite, receiving blocks and transactions, um, and you can then transmit your own transaction, which is 350 bytes, using a text message to a gateway that injects it onto the Bitcoin network, um, or a very, very low bandwidth transmission system. Uh, the first such uh, satellite transmission mechanism was introduced recently, and um, you, know, you can envision a situation where you even have um, a field-capable kit where you just pop up a foldable um, satellite dish, um, you know, a solar panel, um, and a software-defined radio for your laptop, and you can sync the blockchain anywhere in the world where the satellite coverage exists, of course. Christopher asks, this next question refers to Cornell University's selfish mining model quoted on page 30 of the course. It's about the threshold of honest, non-nefariously colluding miners at which Bitcoin solves the Byzantine General's problem and creates the guarantee for Bitcoin system integrity. Is it 51% of the hashing power? Is it 66% of the hashing power? And what countermeasures might work against dishonest miners? Ultimately, any Bitcoin or other blockchain a uh, serious integrity or security deficiency might also provide an opportunity to big governments, heavily centralized corporations, or other organizations to enter the fray to attack Bitcoin. In that sense, uh, the Cornell University Bitcoin adjustment suggestion sounds interesting. In order to patch this theoretical yet possible Bitcoin deficiency while keeping it decentralized, is it gaining any attention and traction? Um, it isn't at the moment, quite honestly, although there are some proposals um, to introduce certain measures that prevent against dishonest miners and selfish mining capabilities um, by having other hybrid um, measures in addition to uh, proof of work. And I think we're going to see a lot of experimentation in the future. For the time being, what that means is that um, at the moment, 33% of the hashing power could engage in selfish mining. Now, this is a very um, high-risk option for the miners. Um, if successful, they can introduce double spend. And for the most part, really, selfish mining is uh, a destructive attack. It's not an attack that gains the miner something, really. Uh, the opportunities for double spending uh, are pretty limited. The most effective reason for doing an attack like that is not to gain, but a willingness, in fact, to spend a lot of money to destroy or damage or deny service in Bitcoin for a prolonged period of time, uh, even knowing that while executing this attack, you're not going to gain anything and probably spend a lot of money doing it. So what you need is not just a selfish miner, not just a dishonest miner, but a dishonest miner who is motivated not by profit, but in fact is willing to spend a lot of money just to damage Bitcoin, which of course is a, is a strong possibility, um, especially for censorship by state agents or collusion between multiple state agents. Um, now, a third of the hashing power, you know, with the rate at which hashing power has escalated, becomes very difficult to do. Um, and there are a number of countermeasures against that, including the most obvious countermeasure, which we could call the nuclear option, which is a hard fork to change the proof-of-work algorithm, thereby rendering all of the equipment that has been amassed uh, into um, slag, you know, turning it useless. So there are defenses uh, that the Bitcoin community can Marshall, but these defenses are themselves very, very high cost defenses that can cause a lot of damage. We'll see in the future if selfish mining uh, has some emergent defenses against it. For the time being, 
I think the practical concern is not high enough uh, to, to justify additional research or practical deployment against that. Daniel asks, as we see in session two, the mechanism that Bitcoin uses to confirm transactions and resolve the Byzantine General's problem is based on consensus of the network. We now have the pressure for activating SegWit2x on November 1st. It may cause a hard fork uh, in the blockchain. Is this an attack on the Byzantine General's problem solution? Um, no. It isn't, uh, and and the reason it isn't is because fundamentally the consensus algorithm, especially of the Bitcoin blockchain, but more generally of blockchains, is is not a coercive system. It's a, it's an opt-in system, and the decision as to which is the correct chain is an entirely subjective decision that is made on a node by node basis. So, which is the real Bitcoin? There is no general answer to that. You each choose which is the real Bitcoin for your perspective by running a node that validates with a set of consensus rules that you believe are what represents the real Bitcoin. So it's an entirely subjective experience. If you have 16 million people who are running Bitcoin, they can form 16 million different impressions of what they believe the real Bitcoin is. Now, out of that, of course, something emerges, um, a majority, perhaps, that has more economic activity, more market traction, more hashing power. But that is not always clear-cut. Um, so in the end, the only thing that matters is the individual perspective. You are not coerced into making that choice, uh, and it's an opt-in system. The Byzantine general problem solution or the consensus algorithm operates within the set of nodes that are following those consensus rules. So if part of the network forks off, that's not a failure of the Byzantine general's problem. The consensus algorithm continues to operate. It continues to operate on two separate networks, each of which is fully enforcing the, the consensus algorithm is fully achieving Byzantine general fault protection, but, um, but separately from the rest of the network. I think um, one way of looking at this is the idea of a voluntary cooperation is to imagine it this way. Uh, let's say you have a basketball court, and um, you have... 12 people who show up and they want to play a game of, of pickup basketball. And maybe um, eight of the people who are there uh, want to make sure that the rules of this particular game of, of basketball um, are, are somewhat, um, somewhat softer, meaning uh, that aggressive fouls or um, aggressive defense, a uh, few thrown elbows, maybe a bit of shoving and pushing, um, is tolerated. They want to play a slightly harder game of basketball. And six of the people there, or maybe uh, four of the people there, don't want to do that. They want to, they want to play a less rough game. Well, um, the good news is that Eight of them can play on one side of the court, and four of them can play on the other side of the court, each following their own set of rules, uh, not stepping on each other's toes, and fork the basketball court in two. And so then the question is, do the rules of basketball still apply? Well, yes. Uh, in each of the two games that are happening, the rules of basketball have been preserved according to whatever those rules are, based on the interpretation of the people who are participating in that game. And nobody's forced to join one or the other game. In fact, they can just take their ball and go home and decide not to play that day. Um, and really, that's what consensus is uh, in a very simple way. Pamela asks, authorized an issue. Hello, and thank you for consideration of this question. Given that 21 million Bitcoin is the maximum number to be issued, and about 16 and a half million have now been issued, if they were all issued 
to miners, then how was the first transaction started that required mining? So if Bitcoin are issued on a 10-minute issuance schedule with ever-decreasing amounts. When we say that 21 million is the maximum amount, it's not actually 21 million. If you follow the issuance curve, the actual amount of Bitcoin that will be issued is 20 million uh, 997,000 and some change. Uh, so it approaches 21 million asymptotically, meaning that it will never reach that number. Uh, there won't be 21 million coins ever. There will be just short of 21 million coins. But essentially, these are not issued until a block comes into existence. And once all of the um, Bitcoin comes into existence with a last uh, amount of reward, a uh, reward of one Satoshi issued to uh, the last block that contains a mining reward sometime in the year 2141, theoretically. Um, what happens after? Well, you got to understand that at that point, um, miners are mostly uh, rewarded by fees and not by rewards uh, from the coin base, meaning that it's not uh, a seniorage reward, the reward issued for creating new coins. It is a transaction fee reward that is the most important reward. In fact, we're already seeing that now. At moments of um, high capacity, sorry, high use, low capacity, and high fees, um, the reward uh, contained in, in a block um, often is at a 60-40 ratio, where 60% is new coins, but 40% is already fees uh, during some very heavily used times of the network. So if you can imagine over time the amount of fees uh, increasing, not because they're more expensive, but more importantly because adoption leads to more transactions, at some point the fees are more than the coin more than the um, seniorage reward. Uh, and from then on, the main determinant of security is transaction fees and not new coins mined. So mining never stops. Uh, it's just that the attention and reward mechanism of miners shifts more and more towards fees in a very smooth and predictable way until eventually the new coin issuance is irrelevant. And in fact, that happens a lot long before 21 million uh, Bitcoin um, are issued. Probably in the next 10 years, the, uh, the consistently the fee will exceed the mining reward. Larissa asks, are blocks really an advantage in the blockchain? Do the blocks that are formed in the blockchain need to exist? If every single transaction was validated by itself, wouldn't that solve the block size uh, problem? Wouldn't it be faster to validate just a single transaction? Is it possible to create a cryptocurrency without blocks? Uh, yes, in fact, you can. Um, in fact, many of the systems that use um, a decentralized signing algorithm instead of a proof-of-work mining algorithm don't really need blocks. Uh, blocks are needed for proof-of-work, and because um, doing the proof-of-work on the granularity of a single transaction essentially means um, increasing the rate at which blocks are found. So let's say you did it. Uh, each transaction was its own block. It had its own proof of work and was chained to the previous transaction. Miners just selected a single transaction, calculated proof of work on it, and issued that transaction. That is perfectly possible. The problem with it is that the rate of orphaned blocks increases dramatically. So right now, you can have a fork that occurs in the chain when uh, a block is orphaned because two blocks were found more or less simultaneously within a 10-minute window. If you make that 10-minute window five-minute, the number of orphaned blocks increases quite significantly, um, and you have to account for that in the algorithm. And there have been some attempts to shrink that uh, all the way down to about 15 seconds, which is what Ethereum does. Um, but Ethereum, in order to do that, has a special mechanism for accounting for orphaned blocks. Um, 
and sharing the reward between uh, multiple winners of the proof of work, if you like. If you went all the way down to a singular transaction and you increase the throughput rate of transactions, you're now talking about doing a thousand blocks per second, each one, just one transaction. And then the problems with forking the network and synchronizing it become insurmountable. Um, the only way you can do that is if you no longer care about competition between miners, if you no longer care about proof of work, if the consensus algorithm is fundamentally different. And we see that in distributed ledger technology, where it's signing instead of mining, where the energy requirement is zero, and um, where you can now essentially uh, issue blocks as fast as you want, at which point you don't need blocks anymore. You can just chain transactions together, which is why a lot of people don't consider DLTs, distributed ledger technology, to be blockchains. They're not blockchains because they don't require blocks and they don't require chains. How does a free blockchain work? In Bitcoin, the miners are rewarded, but in a blockchain to keep contracts, who will do the validation? Or the question can be, can a blockchain exist without miners? Um, yes, a blockchain can exist without miners. A blockchain can exist without proof of work. A blockchain can exist without uh, a game theoretical competitive consensus algorithm. Um, however, it won't be a decentralized blockchain. It will require trusted third parties, and these trusted third parties will be the ones doing the validation. Alternatively, you can consider a mechanism whereby the validation is done based on an alternative consensus algorithm, such as proof of stake. But in that case, you still have reward. Um, it's reward in the form of fees for the risk taken for validating the rules um, and the, the cost of money. Uh, locked up in that validation. So you either have a reward system that allows you uh, to have competition, uh, proof of stake, proof of work, and the variance of that, or you have a system without reward. Um, but in that case, the validators must be trusted. Uh, and then you introduce centralization, trusted third parties, um, and that kind of blockchain can exist, but it's not a blockchain. Um, it's a database. It's a database with digital signatures. Uh, a lot of banks are trying to do exactly that, to create a centralized database and then call it a blockchain so that it appears very innovative, even though it isn't. What happens if two miners solve the next block at the same time, asks Karel. BTC clients trust the longest chain. So if two blocks are mined at the same time, it's probably up to the miners to decide which is going to be accepted, but how do they decide it? This is the fundamental aspect of mining. We're going to talk about it in the uh, future um, sessions when we talk more specifically about mining and forks, but for the time being, let me just prove this. Um, approximately once every uh, week, two blocks are mined nearly at the same time. Miners and nodes decide which one to accept based on which one they see and validate first. This may cause the network to have two different perspectives of which is the correct next longest chain. That is a fork. It happens once a week on average, and it is resolved as long as the next block that comes in doesn't also come in uh, simultaneously, which is a very low probability. Um, Eventually, that fork is resolved because one of the two chains gets extended first, and then the other one uh, has its tip orphaned. The block is no longer considered. All of the transactions are replayed. So in the competition, it is normal for two blocks to be mined near at the same time. Um, the winner is the one who remains on a chain that gets extended in the next round. How are transactions validated after the last block? Asks Hammerton. After the last block is mined and the total number of Bitcoin riches maximum, how will transactions be validated? Won't mining be irrelevant? There is no last block to be mined. Mining continues forever. The only difference is that instead of receiving reward for new Bitcoin, uh, miners receive uh, the sum of the transaction fees in the block. And long before we reach the point where the last 
uh, Bitcoin is created, miners are already ignoring that part of the reward because the fees are so much more of a component. Mining continues forever. Uh, validation continues forever. What shifts is the reward mechanism. Instead of being paid with new coins, miners get paid with transaction fees. That concludes all of the questions we had in the forums. Uh, let's have a quick look. Uh, we have a question here. Can a blockchain be coded in any language? Advantages and disadvantages of different languages? Yes, absolutely. Um, not only can a blockchain be coded in any programming language, but most blockchains are um, essentially consist of multiple different implementations, and these implementations are coded in different languages. The blockchain as a network instance, as a system of software running on a network, is, not, uh, is a specification. Essentially, it is a protocol on how nodes communicate with each other and how they evaluate consensus rules. As long as you can implement those rules and implement the network communication in the programming language of your choice, and in fact, you can do that in any programming language, any Turing complete programming language can implement any program. That is the basis uh, of Turing's understanding of computing. And therefore, any language can express any program, which means that any blockchain can be written in any Turing complete language. Um, Bitcoin has implementations in C, uh, in C, in uh, Java, in Perl, in uh, Python in JavaScript, and a whole number of other, and uh, sorry, also in Go. Um, Ethereum has implementations in uh, Go, and C++, and Rust, uh, and many other languages. And so, yes, you can. Advantages and disadvantages of them? Well, security is a key consideration. And some languages are better at security than others, and it has a lot to do with certain key features that are important in the implementation of network protocols and um, application programming interfaces. So a couple of considerations that are important when choosing a language to implement something like this. You assume that your node is going to get attacked um, and that the network itself is going to get attacked. So languages that are better at defending against attacks uh, and are better at protecting you against um, creating code with vulnerabilities and bugs are going to work better for implementing this. Um, the two main categories, I would guess, of, of such bugs are uh, memory management, so the ability to control where a program uh, uses memory on while it's executing, to protect against uh, specific classes of vulnerabilities, uh, buffer overrun attacks, code injection attacks, fuzzing, various things like that, uh, any type of tainted input attack. And the second one is, is type security, meaning that if your language says that an integer is an integer, um, or it says that a value is a Boolean, or a floating point number, or a 256-bit integer signed, or whatever, uh, that you can have some kind of type security. Some languages have strict typing, some languages have very loose typing, where you can take something that's an integer and also use it as a string. And then things get very messy because that can introduce bugs uh, that are difficult to track down when you inadvertently use a variable um, in an operation where that type is not appropriate. Uh, and you get unexpected results. Uh, strongly typed languages prevent you from doing that. Um, compiled languages are better at strong typing than interpreted languages. There's a reason some people prefer to use languages like Rust um, and, say, C++ to do coding of certain things. Um, then again, C++ uh, has not as clean memory management, so you can have problems with that. So, um, Generally speaking, every possible language will probably be tried by someone. I'm sure someone's tried to write a Bitcoin node in PHP, uh, but not many people are running that, and there's a reason for it. Next question. Are the miners simultaneously verifying the solution of the previous block's cryptographic function while competing to find the puzzle solution for the next new block? 
Um, yes, they are. And um, it takes about 15 to 20 seconds at least to validate a block. Um, and uh, depending on how complicated the block is, how complicated the scripts in, in the block are, and some, some blocks may take less than a second, some blocks uh, take a lot longer because they may contain a lot of complex scripts in them, a lot of signature operations, etc. Um, while miners are validating the block, um, they generally start mining immediately. Um, validationless mining, as it's called. They, they, they mine the next block, they start mining the next block without validation. However, um, in order to do that, they, they must start by mining a new block that is empty. And the reason for that is because they're going to be expending all of this energy trying to find proof of work. They can't include any transactions in the new block because they haven't yet validated the previous block and therefore they don't know which transactions may have already been included and which ones have still to be included. So if they mine a block with a transaction in it and there's a possibility that, that transaction was already included in the previous block and if that block is valid, then all the energy they put into mining the new block is wasted because that block is a double spend and therefore invalid. And the safest way to ensure that the, the block they're mining, while they're still validating the previous block, is itself valid, is to make it an empty block, which is why you see empty blocks being mined. Now, the thing is, because this is a probabilistic game, it doesn't make any difference if you change the block you're mining um, halfway through or 30 seconds into it. So usually what would happen for a miner strategy is while they're validating the previous block, they mine an empty block. As soon as the previous block has been validated and the mempool has been cleared out and reconciled with what transactions are still available, then they can create a new candidate block that contains transactions so they can get the extra profit from the fees and then start mining against that um, and continue putting energy in. It doesn't make any difference because um, the, each attempt to find a hash is probabilistically distinct. It has exactly the same probability as the previous event, whether you change the underlying block or not, whether you started the proof of work nonce from the beginning or not. It doesn't make any difference. You have just as much chance at finding valid proof of work in the very next hash um, as you did in the previous one. The probability doesn't change. So therefore, miners will start mining an empty block, and then 30 seconds in, once they validated the previous block, now they can add some transactions. They're going to just switch to mining a transaction with blocks, with, uh, to mining a block with transactions in it and continue their proof of work. How does the network verify the winning miner solution was correct? How many times is the solution verified and by how many? The network verifies the winning miner solution at every point, meaning that let's say I'm a miner and I've just found a solution that I believe to be valid. I'm going to announce it to all of the nodes that I am directly connected to in order to propagate it across the network. When I tell those nodes I have a new block, they validate it before accepting that block. And they don't tell any other nodes until they validated it, which means that nodes do not propagate across the network until they are validated by every intermediate node. They don't get to reach everyone unless everyone validates them. So the entire network verifies the solution. They verify the solution as soon as they see it and before telling anyone else about it to ensure that they're not propagating invalid blocks. In fact, if a node propagates an invalid block to its neighbors, it will get banned by its neighbors. The neighbors will disconnect uh, from nodes that they consider to be lying, to be propagating invalid information. And they will isolate that node by cutting off connections to it. So you stop talking to people who lie to you uh, when you're on this network. So everybody validates everything. Without validation, it doesn't propagate. And only nodes that propagate uh, are valid nodes, only valid nodes propagate, um, and other miners only see the node, the blocks that other miners have found if everybody thought they are valid. 
So uh, next question is proof of work consensus, developer consensus, minor consensus, exchange consensus, wallet consensus, wallet developer consensus. Can you please develop or expand on these forms of consensus? Yes, one of the questions that comes up often is who decides what the rules are? Um, and the obvious answer is the miners decide what the rules are. Um, but that's not actually true uh, because the miners operate on a chain because it's profitable. And it's profitable only if the underlying currency can be sold on exchanges in order to pay for their electricity. And the exchanges will only accept it if it's on the chain that they consider valid. And the exchanges will only consider a chain valid if their customers who are buying and selling on that chain consider it valid. Uh, and the customers will only consider it valid if the wallets they're using it consider it valid. And the wallets will only consider it valid and the customers will only consider it valid if they can use that uh, cryptocurrency to buy things from merchants. And the merchants will only consider it valid if they have code to run. And all of the above categories will only consider it valid if they have good well-maintained, solid software to run, which means that the developers must consider it valid. But the developers will only consider it valid if they can spend their coins, etc., etc. Essentially, there is an interdependency between all of these constituencies, and all of these constituencies of consensus are themselves overlapping. I am a user. I also am a wallet user and an investor. I can also be a developer. I might even be a miner too. So um, some some nodes and some users belong to multiple different constituencies. Many of the constituencies have overlapping functions. Developers are also users of Bitcoin. Um, some exchanges may also be mining. Uh, they may also run wallets, and the people working at those exchanges are also themselves users. Maybe they also sell T-shirts, so they're merchants. Everybody has to agree, and essentially everybody decides for themselves what rules of consensus are valid. And that decision is made on an individual basis, but the emergent reality happens across all of those individuals together through marketplaces, through essentially the actions of a free market. An astute reader might say, but you have not yet solved the Byzantine journal's problem, just moved it to the miners. What if two miners send out blocks with conflicting information? How do the clients choose? Again, as we said before, they choose based on their own appreciation of the consensus rules. And then if both blocks are fully valid by the consensus rules by all of the clients, then timing matters. The first block to be seen in each part of the network gets chosen. And if more than one blocks are seen in more than one part of the network, and the network finds itself with two competing realities, then the next block will resolve that, because the longest chain is something that evolves over time. And when the next block is found, it will settle the dispute between the two competing versions of reality by making one of those chains, the one it's built upon, longer. Uh, so the longest cumulative difficulty valid chain wins. But each one of those components is important. Longest cumulative difficulty valid chain. Which chain is valid? Whichever one your node thinks is valid. And if a network is big enough, that's the valid chain. Which is the longest? Well, it's the one that has the most proof of work in it. Um, and so these things all work together. Um, the Byzantine General's problem is not solved in one place. Byzantine General's problem is solved through the collaborative action of every participant in the system who has a small role to play, and all of these add up. All right, let's see what other questions we have. Ritik asks, on my response about counting the connection with a node that is lying, do all following nodes find it at the same time? Can there be a mixed understanding of an invalid node? How is the consensus taken? Again, it's entirely a matter of perspective. I only care 
about my perspective, meaning that if I'm running a node, the perspective of my node is the only one that matters. If I find a node that is lying to me, I will disconnect myself from that node. I don't care what anybody else does. As far as I'm concerned, that node isn't following the consensus rules that I chose. From my perspective, they're invalid. Are they invalid to everyone? No. Maybe I'm the one who's running uh, consensus rules that are invalid to everybody else. Maybe I've been cut off from everybody else, uh, in which case I might find myself in the minority, outside of the broader consensus. Consensus is an individual perspective. I don't tell anybody else who to believe, and I don't believe anybody else. Um, my node will decide on its own which nodes it will talk to, which answers it will believe, which rules it will validate. And my goal or role as a node operator, as someone who runs a node or chooses a wallet or signs up with an exchange, is to pick the one that follows the consensus rules that I believe are the right consensus rules for this network. Um, can I explain the most important differences between proof-of-work and proof-of-stake? Very simply, uh, proof-of-work requires the investment of energy which is outside of the system in the form of work. And that energy um, is a scarce resource. Energy has cost everywhere, anywhere, in any form. has some cost. And proof-of-work forces miners to deposit that energy in the form of work and prove that they've deposited that energy by producing proof of work in order to validate and claim a probability of a reward. Proof of stake does a similar function, only instead of requiring the validators to deposit energy in the form of work, it requires them to deposit cryptocurrency within the system in the form of a stake. They basically bet cryptocurrency that gets locked up for a certain number of blocks, and they put that behind their claim to validate the rules. If everybody agrees with the validation of their rules, they remain on the majority chain, and they get a small reward back in the form of fees in return for the stake that they put in proportional to the stake that they put in. And if, instead, they find themselves on the wrong chain, depending on how proof-of-stake is implemented, they may lose some or all of their stake, or they may simply end up with their stake locked up for a while without being able to gain anything from it. And Ricardo asks, this overly technical talk is getting extremely tedious. Will he talk about something interesting? Uh, no, <laughs> this is a university course. And um, technical talk is exactly what this is about. Unfortunately, if you want to join one of my podcasts, when we can talk about things that are funny. Can the cost of energy be minimized by green energy? What about the economy of the whole world mining in such a case? Yes, in fact, um, green energy plays a very important role in mining because one of the characteristics of mining is that it can occur anywhere, especially now that we have uh, the ability to receive blocks by satellite. Uh, you can pretty much do mining anywhere in the world where you have energy. Uh, and that energy can come from any source. It can come from wind, it can come from solar, it can come from hydroelectric, it can come from dirty coal, it can come from nuclear energy. Um, it can come from any of these sources. But um, energy has different properties, and the generation... Uh, well, actually, energy doesn't. Energy is fungible, but energy production facilities have different properties. For example, um, solar produces the most amount of energy during the midday uh, noon sun, and the least amount of energy at night, uh, which is zero. 
And often, the amount of energy that is produced does not match the amount of energy that is consumed at those times. So in fact, the most energy that is consumed in a city is usually around 8 or 9 p.m. in the evening, um, whereas the production of solar energy is not peaking at that time. It's near zero. How do you reconcile these two mismatches? Essentially, you have energy that is being produced, that is being produced for free once you have the capacity in place, uh, the capital cost is in place, there is no operating cost for a solar energy system other than small maintenance cost. And therefore, if you're producing it in the middle of the day and nobody needs that energy, that energy is wasted. So mining can actually take that wasted energy and use it to produce income. And what that income does is it allows you to very rapidly depreciate the capital expense of building the solar plant in the first place, which means that you can take a solar plant that otherwise would be, um, that would be depreciated over a period of, say, five years or ten years, and you can depreciate it over a period of one or two years. Uh, which leads to an enormous investment in solar, because if you can uh, depreciate the cost of the uh, underlying capital, uh, that makes the deployment of solar much cheaper. Uh, and of course, for the miners who are mining on this energy, the cost of that energy can be much lower, um, so the profitability can be much higher. Because mining can happen anywhere, mining will happen in the places where electricity is cheapest, where the difference between capacity and demand is the greatest, where the ability to distribute the electricity by other means, such as high voltage distribution networks, exists less or doesn't exist at all. And all of those represent opportunities. In fact, that means that the greatest opportunities for mining are from sources of alternative energy, such as wind, solar, and hydroelectric, uh, geothermal even. Um, because those are the sources that are remote, often from uh, populated areas, that are difficult to distribute because of the cost of distribution networks, and where there is a large mismatch between capacity and demand. Uh, which means that Bitcoin is currently uh, underwriting massive investments in alternative energy around the world. Giovanni asks, isn't the size of the blockchain an issue for the ordinary PC? Currently, my Bitcoin folder size is 153 gigabytes. Definitely an issue preventing people to be part of the transaction validation process. Giovanni, you are correct. In fact, um, an even bigger problem is the cost of bandwidth, because in order to create that blockchain of 153 gigabytes on your hard drive, you probably transmitted and received close to a terabyte of data across your internet connection. Um, in many cases, a single node is connected to eight other nodes. For every block they receive, they transmit it eight times to eight neighboring nodes. Uh, which results in eight times the amount uh, of data being transmitted outbound. Um, and they'll also receive and retransmit uh, blocks that eventually don't end up in the blockchain, orphan blocks. Those still will get transmitted. And they will support um, uploading the blockchain again and again to clients that are bootstrapping for the first time, to thin clients that are syncing for the first time. Yes, disk and bandwidth are great considerations. This is the primary argument for keeping the block size to a limited size in order to allow uh, as many people as possible to run fully independent validating nodes um, around the world to create a robust decentralized network with the idea that if the uh, space capacity bandwidth requirements of nodes escalate rapidly, uh, as we're seeing, for example, on the Ethereum chain, eventually that's going to lead to fewer and fewer people running nodes, uh, more and more corporate data center centralized uh, solutions for running nodes, which then become much easier to coerce, to sue, to shut down, to attack, and make the network less robust. All right. Say something about J.P. Morgan Chase and Jamie Dimon. 
the Jamie doth protest too much, methinks, to quote Shakespeare. And on that uh, humorous note, um, we've reached the end of the Byzantine general problem sessions for the eighth iteration of the MOOC, the Massively Open Online course for the University of Nicosia's Digital Currency Master's degree. Um, thank you all so much for participating. Thanks for the great questions. We managed to keep it on topic almost uh, the entire time with a few silly exceptions. And uh, we're ready for the next session. Please um, discuss the topics on the forum. Start putting your questions up as soon as possible so we have great material to talk about next time. And I'll see you next week.